Our next speaker, <clears throat> Kirk James uh, Beatty, is the author of Congress and the Shaping of the Middle East, as well as two books on Egyptian politics, Egypt during the Nasser years and Egypt during the Sadat years. Uh, Professor Beatty uh, is at Simmons College in the Political Science and International Relations Department, specializing in comparative politics with regional expertise in Middle East and West European politics. He's taught at Harvard, Wellesley, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and the University of Michigan. He's a recipient of numerous national scholarships, including a Fulbright Grant, a Fulbright Hayes Grant, and an International Rotary Foundation Fellowship an American Research Center in Egypt grant and a Center for Arabic Study Abroad Fellowship. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the people at uh, IRMAP and the Washington Report for uh, inviting me here. I've uh, uh, benefited uh, tremendously from uh, their work over the years and from the ability to interview some of them uh, for actually the book that I uh, uh, completed not long ago. I am uh, by formal training uh, a Middle East specialist um, and as Grant just said my first uh, two books were ones that were related to Egypt. Um, uh, my children were at a certain age where I didn't think it made much sense to be taking them out of the country again, uh, ripping them out of the school system here. Um, to maybe a more dubious uh, educational possibility in Egypt. And so I decided to uh, follow up on an idea that I'd had for a number of years, which was to come down to uh, DC, make numerous trips here, uh, to look into a subject uh, that had been on my mind for a long time, and that was one that dealt with the role that Congress plays in the shaping of um, Middle East policy. Um, a lot of people have argued that Congress doesn't have much, have much of a role in, in this issue area, so I'll come back to later on, um, but I, I, I thought that this could make for an interesting topic and one that had not been uh, written on very extensively at all. I um, like to use as my primary method of analysis one of doing elite interviewing, and so for my first two books I interviewed very extensively people in the broad Egyptian political elite. I want to do the same thing here because I think that by talking to people who are involved in playing the political game themselves, that gives you, as an outsider, myself being the outsider, the best possible view of how the insiders um, are behaving, what, what motivates them to you know, uh, take their decisions in the way that they do. I also knew that probably the people who were actually um, serving as members of Congress were people that might have a more difficult time talking very frankly uh, about these matters uh, because they're still in the hot seat, so to speak. Uh, but that if I approached uh, staffers and, and gave them, of course, the promise of anonymity that, that they might be able to, if they assented to my request, speak much more openly and frankly about these issues, not only telling me, of course, how they went about doing their own uh, uh, jobs, but also uh, how they perceived the, uh, their bosses uh, um, behaving. So um, this is what I did. Um, and. I, I came down and I, I generated a random sample for members of the House. Um, I, in other words, I put 435, you know, zero to 435 in the, in the computer hopper, so to speak, and randomly generated numbers that I associated with the names of each of the members of Congress. And then I just started to work my way down that list so that I would have as, as close to a random sample of members of the House as I possibly could. I went into um, all um, 100 um, uh, Senate uh, offices requesting interviews. That typically, whether it was on the House side or on the Senate side, I would walk in. Um, you know, you're naked in Washington, D.C. if you don't have your, your, ID, your card, right, your business card. So I'd pull out a business card and present myself, tell them why I was there. I was hoping to speak with the person who had the foreign policy portfolio for whomever the boss was in that, in that uh, particular office. Uh, and that I would like to you know, speak with them uh, for the purpose of doing a book on, again, the role that Congress played in shaping Middle East policy. So I, I, in the end, ended up with somewhere on the order of at least one interview with 130 or more House members, and then later on I went back. Uh, my initial wave of interviews was in the 2005-2006 period. I came back down here, made numerous trips again between 2011 and 2013 to follow up. Uh, with uh, additional interviews, typically on the second round, talking to uh, as many people as I had met the first time around, 
um, um, uh, and on the on the so on the on the house side, I talked to about 130 uh, people initially, and then had follow-up interviews with a number of them. On the Senate side, I had interviews with over 30 uh, Senate staffers total, which I think were reasonably decent uh, representative numbers um, uh, across the board. So this this book that I've written is one that's uh, very heavily based on um, my interviews with the staffers, um, and. I tried to begin just by getting an idea of who they were. These are people that play an incredibly important role for, for their bosses, for the members of Congress. The members of Congress would be incapable of, of moving on all kinds of issues in any way you know, uh, resembling an intelligent fashion if they didn't have the assistance of these staffers. So I was very curious as to who the staffers themselves were. Uh, where were they coming from? How did they get the job? Um, uh, you know, how were they recruited? Uh, what kind of, where, did, where have they studied? Where had they done their, uh, uh, you know, their, their uh, university uh, studies? If they, had they gone to graduate school or not at all? Were they political scientists? Were they people that had uh, studied you know, in other disciplines? Were they people that had ever taken a course on Middle East politics and so forth? So I spent quite a bit of time trying to get to know the staffers reasonably well at the beginning of my uh, interview, asking them how old they were, how long they'd been up on the hill, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I think I came up with a reasonably uh, good sense of, of, of who the people were. And then of course, the, the bigger issue was to try to figure out how they went about doing their work and uh, how they went about advising their, their bosses and what kind of communications they had then with their bosses and, and ultimately how their bosses thought about issues in, in this issue area and arrived at their own decisions. Now, I, I have not worked on the Hill. I had not worked on the Hill um, ever. I still have not ever worked on the Hill in, in terms of being uh, in some sort of a staffing capacity at all. So I, this was new to me. I'm not an Americanist by my formal training. I'm a person that studied uh, Middle East politics and so forth. And so I walked into these offices, and when I started sitting down with the first people uh, with whom I was conducting these um, interviews, I would say, okay, well, you're the person who has the foreign policy uh, portfolio for uh, Representative X. Is this all that you do? Now, so I know that there must be some people in this room that know the answer to this question and maybe know this a lot better than I do. But I, I was stunned because they would say, well, yes, I do foreign policy. Um, I also do defense. I do intelligence. I do Homeland Security, um, I do Veterans Affairs, I do taxation, I do the environment, um, I do immigration issues. Now I think I may be up to about eight or nine enormous portfolios at this point, but usually they went up to about 12 to 14 different portfolios. This is on the House side. How can any human being possibly be knowledgeable and have expertise in this many different issue areas. It's just, it's just humanly impossible. And these are, the, these are the individuals that are providing the information to their bosses across this range of uh, issues and upon whom the bosses are depending to, to a considerable extent. The, the modal age for my house um, um, uh, interviewees was 23. So they're directly out of school. I, I talk to my students at school now and I, I say to them, look at, you know, you're just a couple years removed from <laughs> being you know, highly qualified to, uh, to, to, to go on and be working in a, in, a, in a house office. On the Senate side of the picture, uh, it was different in that you had maybe um, half as many portfolios or possibly slightly fewer in some cases that were being carried by the Senate staffers. And the modal age did go up to 36 uh, in that case. So there's a significant disparity across the two sides of the hill, yet the House plays its role and the people on the Senate side play their own role. By the way, there isn't a lot of communication across the board between the two if you weren't aware of that. But I was, I was blown away again then by um, the, the, the hard work, of course, that was putting, being put in by the, the staffers on both sides, including on the House side, but the lack of expertise, the lack of knowledge by by the, maybe the youthful exuberance and that they brought to their jobs, but by the, the lack of uh, deeper knowledge. And so I would have people who had been around um, there for three or four years, whom I came to consider more as being like veterans, right, if they'd been working on the Hill for three to four years, and they would look at me and say, ah, so you've come here to, uh, to find out how little we know in this issue area, right? This is kind of a standard thing that I, I came up with. Now, I, I, didn't, I didn't go in with the intention of um, focusing on APAC. I've been sort of asked to, to, if I would focus a bit more on APAC for the purpose of this presentation. I'm very happy to do so. I well note, though, that 
of all the different um, um, organizations, um, lobbyists and so forth that were mentioned to me, and there was not a very long list of, of, of organizations that was mentioned to me uh, by the staffers, the only one that came up uh, consistently by every single staffer was that of APAC. Every single staffer, even if they'd been there for a very short amount of time, was familiar with APAC. They'd been made aware of its existence from very early on because people from APAC, highly professional, very, very quick to, 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 to move in and to introduce themselves and make themselves known and to offer their assistance to people in office and, 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 and knowing that maybe there's a brand new person on the job in a particular office. So APAC, I you know, came to learn from others, was described uh, in very positive terms by many, many people, but also as kind of the 800-pound gorilla um, by others, by a number of other people. Um, I looked that up. There really aren't 800-pound gorillas. The biggest gorillas only get to be 600 pounds or so. So if you want to take away anything of interest from this talk, at least you have that going for you. <laughs> now, what... Um, how does APEC go about then incurring its uh, influence? I'm, I'm narrowing the focus a bit now. It begins with elections, and it begins very, very early. In fact, it begins before people are even running for Congress, per se. APEC invests a lot of efforts, perhaps with the, 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 the assistance. I, I need to talk to Grant so I've had an opportunity with the JCRC groups that he was talking about earlier on at the community level. In, um, in scouting uh, individuals, looking for rising stars um, on either side of the political aisle to try to see whether somebody who's running for a municipal council in a major city or for some lower level job looks like he or she has the potential to rise up to be quite a bright, promising, uh, or, or is showing themselves as a bright, promising uh, uh, political candidate who might, over the longer run, then be somebody who is interested in running for a congressional office. And so from very early on, the vetting process uh, begins, um, even before people are running for Congress. And also opportunities are extended, and this I think is going to be spoken about later on by um, Gideon Levy, if I'm not mistaken, in his keynote speech. So I'm not going to go into this in any greater detail now, but opportunities are provided such as trips to, to Israel. So the, the, the attempt to socialize people who are perceived even as potential candidates for running for Congress begins at a very early age from the perspective of some of these groups, including that of APAC. In addition, of course, um, money plays an exceptionally important role. I had one young um, Jewish American staffer who said to me, uh, in a very friendly way, he's trying to forewarn me, now don't, whatever you do, don't talk about the money. I, I know that he was afraid that if I started talking about the money at any point, or mentioned this in the book, that that would open me up all the more to accusations of anti-Semitism and so forth, because it's a standard trope, right? And so I, I thanked him for having done that, but how does one ignore the money when the Congress persons, if I can use that term, themselves spend the bulk of their time um, looking for money. I mean, they only arrive, some of them here, um, uh, as Representative David Obey, long time, you know, veteran um, on, on the uh, House side, told me um, here, um, uh, maybe on uh, Tuesday morning or something like that, work, you know, Tuesday through Thursday, and then they're on a plane by, by late Thursday or Friday morning back to their home constituencies to raise money again, and they're raising money, you know, while they're in their offices here as well. So money is ex exceptionally important to all these individuals, as you all well know. And APEC, as a 501c4 organization, cannot provide direct assistance this way, but they do uh, then arrange for large um, meetings uh, uh, with uh, people that are coming from the particular, uh, from a, usually on a regional basis, and then at these regional meetings, uh, which are fundraising activities for APAC, they'll put people um, who are uh, congressional candidates in, in touch with donors at those particular organizations. So this is the way that the APAC tends to work these things out. Um, the um, relative absence of significant countervailing influences here is important. Because you know the first thing that people over the years have thought about in terms of a countervailing influence to to pro I like to say more pro right wing Israeli government um, um, uh, uh, actors is the oil lobby. So I would listen to my again interviewees talk about uh, individuals um, that they were being contacted by and who had influence in whatever shape and manner and so forth, and um, and they would. Actually, again, to a person, not talk at all about the oil lobby. 
So finally, at the end of this segment of the interview, I would say, well, but what about the oil lobby? And they would, they would sit back, and they would kind of, these are even people coming from oil-producing states, and they would scratch their heads, and they would say, mm, no, we never hear from uh, people from the oil lobby at all on things relating to this issue, which I found very, very interesting. Um, so once the people are elected and they arrive on the Hill, what are they, how, how does APAC uh, uh, try to sustain its influence? Well, um, numerous uh, measures. First of all, um, they are very active in providing members of Congress with, with um, letters, with the Dear Colleague letters, and with the provision of materials uh, that set um, bills uh, in action. So this is one important uh, factor. I'm going to have to skip through maybe some of these things along the way because I see the clock is, is, is ticking down on me at a ferocious pace. Um, <laughs> they keep scorecards on, uh, on the way that people vote. They very heavily use and, and, and intelligently have recourse to their own constituents. And so they, people in the off, these offices are much more likely to want to listen to and hear from their own constituents and will respond to constituent concerns than they are to listen to peop, people that are coming from the outside. But the, the staffers, again, know of, uh, of, of APAC's significance and so forth, and so APAC can get its foot in the door in a way that a lot of other um, uh, actors or interest groups and lobbyists are not allowed um, to do so. Um, they go to um, great length then to keep score of how people are voting. They communicate that information back to their to their um, constituents. Constituents call on a regular basis uh, so that they become uh, people that have first name uh, basis contact with the person that holds the foreign policy portfolio, like Kevin's on the line from Cincinnati or whatever. You know, would you take it? And they'll take the call and they'll talk to people that way. Again, this is not a game that is being played with anywhere near the same um, success by any of, of the other uh, lobbyists compared to APEC. Another thing, again, and this is what's structural in nature about the way that APEC succeeds, is that they know exactly how strapped these staffers are in terms of um, the time that they have allotted to deal with any particular issues. And so for APEC to come along and basically deliver talking points and information to them on a silver platter makes life so much uh, easier for them that they're very happy to be on the receiving end of that information. Yet another point um, that's somewhere up there, I'm probably wandering at this point in terms of, I can't really kind of read these things <laughs> without putting my glasses on. So anyway, well, the, is that many of the, many of the staffers, uh, of course, only last on these jobs for a, a very short number of years. They're only there for one or two or three years, right? They're not being very well paid, and so they know that if they can get a job with, the, with lobbyists, for any lobbying firm, then after they've been on the job for, again, a short number of uh, years and have acquired that experience, they can leave the Hill, go to work for a lobbyist, and they can start making three times as much money as they were, at least three times as much money as they were being paid um, as, as a staffer. Now, I want you to think about that a little bit longer because if, if your longer run objective then is one of being hired by a lobbyist, I'm now broadening the folks to think about you know, the implications for the, the influence of other special, special interest groups, then how likely are you to be biting the hand of people that are trying to provide you information for free if you might want to go be employed by, by those people over the longer run? So all these kinds of factors you know, come into consideration. Um, another thing that's going on then is the one of the foxes being placed in, in, in charge of the chicken uh, coop, so to speak. And so, if you have the time, look very carefully to see which individuals um, have served over time as the, um, you know, the, the, the chairs or the ranking members and so forth of the uh, committee and subcommittee in foreign policy and appropriations. And what you'll tend to find in this issue area that we're just discussing here um, are people who are coming from what one more conservative or right-wing staffer described to me as dark blue uh, as opposed to light blue, meaning in terms of their commitment to Israel kind of backgrounds. And you'll tend to see people who are coming from, you know, very um, hardcore, dark blue um, um, Jewish American uh, uh, districts in the country, or people that are coming from evangelical backgrounds, or people that are security hawks. And so they tend to be clustered in these committees and subcommittees of foreign policy and appropriations in a way that's, that's very important. Now, 
let me just try to, to, to wrap things up here. Is Congress's role important? You've had a lot of people along the way who have argued that this, that this is n not the case. Um, Aaron David Miller has written about this fairly extensively. I imagine a lot of people in the room have heard of him. People on the left, like Noam Chomsky, have written about this, that the lobby doesn't play a very important role. Um, I beg to disagree. The president has tremendous um, power, of course, but it's the Congress, again, over time, that does things like um, sign the bills that provide the $3.2 billion annually and now maybe going up to $5 billion annually in, annually in terms of assistance to, to Israel. And so I like you know, to, to, to think of this in terms of maybe a, a horse trainer who can butte up, you know, sort of drug uh, a horse so that it performs more marvelously in a, in a, in a, in a race. Uh, but that this potentially, you know, injurious over the longer run to the, to the, to the health of the horse, so to speak. And let me just finish then by saying that um, I, I think, you know, the question is posed, is Apex influence then bad for um, America? Um, and what I learned along the way from the staffers, and really so much of the book is based, again, on these the hundreds of interviews that I did with the staffers, um, is that um, you have people who are even Jewish American staffers who are embarrassed by the power of APEC. You have many, many other staffers, including Jewish American staffers, who are disgusted by the power of APEC. In over 30 years of teaching on this subject, not once ever have I in the classroom ever accused any of the members of Congress or any of the uh, actors in the executive branch of, 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 of having dual loyalties or of being treasonous. And yet I can tell you that I had interviews with people who are coming from both Republican and Democrat backgrounds who, who told me, again, anonymously and deferred when I asked them to give me specific names, um, things like insert the name of any other country into the formula and any member of Congress for their behavior would be accused of treason. So I'll conclude on that note. Thank you. We've got a hard stop at 10.20. Um, just to note that uh, Dr. Matson will be signing his book uh, at the conclusion of this panel over in the exhibition hall.